families are used to drinking wine at home. You know, that's the wine your parents drink when you're a kid. Uh, you know, the drink, sorry, the, you know, cocktails are not very common. Beer, you know, some people drink beer, but not much. Uh, mostly people drink wine. So that's an important part of the culture. And so going on the map, so if you think of the province, you know, here, um, I can't point, uh, well, actually, yeah, I can put my arrow. So here's the province of Mendoza, all the way up in the northern part. And remember, in Argentina, northern is warmer. South is cooler. So, doctor, I'm so sorry. I just want to pause you because I want to hear all this good stuff, but we're going to let the audience in oh, in okay. like a minute. Okay. <laughs> so okay. I will, they're going to come in and catch you halfway through and all of this passion. I want them to hear it but, too. But why, so, don't, why don't I just unshare? Should I stop share? Why don't I stop share? And then if we you, start. If you don't yeah. mind at the very beginning yeah. and then go I'm in and do it. Share, and then at some point when we're ready for the first wine, I'll, I'll share just this image from the. Yeah, I don't. I think yeah. they're going to want to see your face. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm just going to show the map and then we'll go. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to put the gallery view, which I think is really nice. Absolutely. Yeah. Before um, before we bring people in and yeah. broadcast, I just want to make sure, I wanted to ask you a little bit about, you know, your observations around COVID-19. Is it something you're comfortable yeah. talking about or should I skip it? Oh, no, absolutely. I'm, I'm a okay. doctor. I mean, this well, is that's, <laughs> that's why I really want your take on it. But yeah. if it was something you didn't want to speak yeah. on, I oh, wouldn't no. put pressure no, on I'm, you. I'm, you know, I'm always here as a doctor. I mean, I actually, well, I can tell you more later. I'm actually, right now my clinic's been closed. So I'm being oh, no. to my friends, but Let's be, let's kind of start off on that. We'll have some Chardonnay, and then I'll start yeah, over. I'll ask perfect. you that question, okay, and you can. Perfect. Okay, so Thanks I'm gonna first thing. I'm gonna try to. Um, we're gonna try to stream this live to Facebook at the same time. Sometimes it works, and it's been very um, glitchy. So we'll cross our fingers for that. The Chardonnay is really pretty. Isn't it beautiful? Get rid of Barb, don't let me forget to talk about my books. Oh I yeah, want... I've got that in my notes too. Yeah, anything you <laughs> want to talk about, I'm here for you. And Thank we're you. going live uh, on Facebook now and I'm gonna bring everybody in here uh, okay. into the Zoom panel. Are you ready? Yeah. Cool. Welcome. Hello. We're starting a broadcast now on Facebook Live, but as people are coming in and joining us here on Zoom, we're going to give us a minute. But as you can see, we're absolutely thrilled to be joined tonight by Dr. Laura Katena. Thanks so much for coming on and chatting with us. Thank you, Barb, and thank you, Benice, for inviting me. We're so happy to have you. I'm, I must say I've been nervous all day. Uh, you're one of my most favorite wine personalities so charming and Thank first you. question I've been dying to ask you uh, where do you get those hats <laughs> oh yes first I want to say hola back to somebody who is saying hola in Spanish to me feel free we can do Spanglish or or I, I want to, to have you write me to me in Spanish if you like to or in English uh, so the hats there is a store in in Argentina it's called Arandu and this is the only store. And actually, I have many of them. In fact, I can show you uh, and one of my other hats. So it has this leather thing in, inside. So that is why they're so comfortable. Because like if you had a wool hat, it wouldn't be that comfortable. But these are very comfortable. And they're actually not a French beret. Uh, because I'm not trying to pretend I'm French because I'm very Argentine. But the gauchos, the, the cowboys in Argentina, they wear these hats. They don't wear cowboy hats. Well, sometimes they do. When it's really sunny, they wear more cowboy looking hats. But on a normal day, they, they wear this and it's called a boina. Can you say that? Boina. I think you're on mute, Barb. Sorry about that. Yeah, a boina? Boina, boina. The word is boina. Well, they're adorable. And every time I see you photographed or on video with one, I'm always envious. When you do bring me down to Mendoza, you'll have to take me shopping. Yeah, you, you have to wear one. And it, it is a good one when you haven't been able to get your hair taken care of for a couple of weeks. Which I haven't uh, for months now, but I just do the, the old ponytail. I, I don't have I a cute hat. You're doing just fine, yes. 
<laughs> well, folks, thanks again for joining us. Uh, as you can see, we're joined by Dr. Laura Catena, Managing Director for Bodega Catena Zapata in Argentina. She also moonlights as an emergency physician in the Bay Area. She has written two books. She is a mother of three. Uh, and in her spare time, she likes to join us to talk about and taste wines. Uh, are you joining us from San Francisco now then? Yes, I, I was actually on my way back to Argentina. I'd been there for harvest in February. I was going to Pro Wine, which is this wine conference where all the wine people meet. And uh, I never made it to Pro Wine and, and, I, and I'd never made it back to Argentina. And then I, I would be on quarantine. And actually now flights have been canceled until September. So I am basically talking to the winery, to the people in the vineyard, to everybody in Argentina all day long. And uh, I have to say, I feel like we're talking more than ever <laughs> because there's no hallway conversations or there's no random encounters these days. You know, if you want to say something, you have to get, you know, on the computer or on your phone. I agree, strangely. I've also felt more connected here in the last few weeks than the last couple of years put together. Uh, it's a strange time, certainly. And that's one of the questions I wanted to ask you about your work uh, at UCSF as an emergency physician. Do you have any general observations um, that you don't mind sharing with us tonight about what you're seeing or any solid medical advice? And then we'll get to the good stuff. Yeah, well, actually, um, it's kind of a, a crazy situation because last year um, in November, actually in September, I, I uh, stopped working as an emergency physician. I was working at uh, UCSF for 25 years, then I was working in the pediatric emergency. Uh, it was a gift to my father's 80th birthday because he's never asked me to stop working as a doctor, but he really needs me. You know, he he w wants to work less, be with the grandkids. And finally, I said, okay, I'm going to move to volunteer doctor. And I was planning to start working at the clinic. Um, there's a, a clinic for the homeless here in San Francisco, the Haight-Ashbury Clinic, which has been around forever. And I had applied for the job and, and it, it was all going to happen. And then they closed it because of COVID. So actually, I, um, I worked my last shift last year. And then now I'm not working as a physician. However, my uh, husband, Dan McDermott, mm -hmm. is, uh, is a physician here in the city. And um, honestly, in San Francisco, because uh, the quarantine started very early and, you know, for random reasons, I mean, who knows when there's outbreaks, it means that maybe a few people came who were positive and didn't know it for a while. Um, in San Francisco, cases are fairly low and the situations in the hospitals are fairly well controlled because they've stopped a lot of the uh, non-essential surgeries. Mm -hmm. So they actually have space. I think as time goes by and as, you know, our, things reopen and, and same day surgeries continue to happen, I think it will be a little busier. But right now it's pretty calm here. How is it in uh, Chicago? Uh, it's been busy. Um, the whole state of Illinois, uh, our, our governor and the mayor of Chicago has been pretty proactive, um, shutting down restaurants and bars very early. Um, fortunately for Benny's and all its employees, we stayed open as an essential business, as a lot of people have expressed gratitude, right? Yes. Uh, I think yes. liquor sales <laughs> is essential this time. Gratitude. <laughs> um, but in general, I think people are staying safe and healthy. Uh, we're starting a mandatory um, masks in public tomorrow, actually, the 1st of May. Um, so I think, um, I think everyone's adapting as well as possible. And uh, I'm grateful to have wine in my glass every day. Today, I'm especially glad uh, I have this gorgeous Catena Chardonnay. This is the 2018. Uh, and what would you like to tell us about this? Yeah, is there so a certain I, region or style that you've always tried yeah. to fashion this after? I, I just want to echo somebody who said healthy and thirsty. I like <laughs> That's that. right. That's very good. Um, and, and I want to remind you, just in terms of essential industries, uh, so our winery was allowed to stay open as well. And we had just um, two weeks to finish the harvest, and it was an early harvest, fortunately. And we had a panic moment where we thought we were going to have to leave all the grapes on the vine. But we were allowed to harvest and we are allowed to ship wine. And we are taking every precaution in, in, imaginable. You know, gone are the days where, you, where people greet each other with a kiss, which is mm -hmm. how you greet people in Argentina, and a hug. And you share mate, you know, you have mate with the straw that people share it. You know, we are 
it's all distancing. We even have plastic separators between people uh, that we put for lunch, which is kind mm -hmm. of sad, but at least you have a separator and you can see the other person. It's, it's kind of like what we're doing right now. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but anyhow, I do think that wine, you, we have to remember uh, us who are in, in the wine industry and in the wine business that uh, wine uh, in moderation, uh, oh, somebody said to bring my, uh, somebody has a, their bombilla for mate. Uh, I should so, mention, uh, Laura, this is Veronica. She's with Wines of Argentina. So oh, she's yeah. one of our, one of our Catena experts. <laughs> hey, Veronica. Great. Okay. Uh, so, um, you know, wine in moderation, which is one glass per day for women and two for men. Uh, and wine in moderation reduces heart attacks, strokes, and dementia by 30%. And that's in good studies. And also, um, it can help uh, control diabetes, uh, you know, the, the sugar uh, levels in diabetes in moderation. Uh, it is true that some cancers are made worse by, by alcohol or by alcohol in excess, but alcohol in moderation is, is good for your health. Uh, and it actually makes you smile more. Did you know that? That people who drink really. wine smile more? So um, I, I do think that, um, you know, when you're used to having a glass of wine with dinner every day, um, it is essential. You know, it's something, an important part of your life. So back to this Chardonnay. So um, Argentina is the lower triangle of South America. And it's a big triangle. Uh, Chile to the western side over the Andes uh, has ocean influence. Argentina has the mountain influence. And the water for our vineyards is mineral water coming from the glaciers. Our skies are clear. You can see every star uh, because there's no pollution. And it's, it's really sort of virgin territory. You know, there, there's just trees and animals on the roads and, and you, you really have a sense that time hasn't passed in Argentina. And there is a wine culture that's very vibrant. You know, in our vineyards, there's people that have been working for generations. You know, the, the father was the, the vineyard manager, now it's the son, and now it's the daughter. You know, so we have families where it used to be always the men in the family mm. would come to manage the vineyard, and now it's the daughters that are that are also uh, working in our vineyards. Um, and uh, and it's, it's just a beautiful thing to see the wine culture of Mendoza. And we are right by the mountains, by the Andes Mountains. So for most of the vineyards in Mendoza, you actually see the snow peaked Andes Mountains right there. That's why if you look at one of our labels, and I don't know who's got them in front of them, it says, high mountain vines that refers to the mountains right next to our vineyards um so um sorry somebody's sending me a mess are you hearing a beep when i get a message or i'm not, not. you're not okay perfect i'll ignore that um okay so so this wine comes from uh three different sites right by the mountains at different altitudes this is catena chardonnay and it's what i call a high altitude blend so when you blend from, you know, the Adriana Vineyard, which is, you know, really cool climate, 5,000 feet elevation, and Agrelo, which is around 3,000 feet elevation, more clay soils, and you blend all of this in, you get this like really elegant, balanced wine that has a little bit of everything because it's got the minerality from the really cool climate, and it's got the richness from the clay soils. And this is, you know, a wine that, you know, despite vintage variability, which should happen, uh, kind of keeps its style, that freshness, that floral, that creaminess year after year. Because, you know, one year we might use more of one component and less of another. Um, so uh, this is a wine that actually even ages well. You know, if you keep it for a couple of years, it, it'll be delicious. I found with Catena Chardonnay, and certainly tonight is no exception, um, there is definitely a very wonderful balance and you spoke to it really well. We frequently talk about Chardonnay in warm climate or cool climate and yours has always seemed to sort of straddle a line right between the two. It does have that richness of fruit, a little bit ripe and I'm detecting a little bit of oak influence, but I think you use neutral barrels, right? Uh, and it's just creamy enough and just enough fruit, but it does. It has that really lovely minerality and freshness. Um, it reminds me a little of a Puy Fosse. Uh, I hope you yeah. accept that as a compliment. Yeah. No. Yeah. You know, I have to say that 
you know, th there's a two-sided answer to, to the Burgundy comparison. First of <laughs> all, you know, my model for Chardonnay came from Burgundy. The reason why my father and I went crazy planting Chardonnay in Argentina, although there were many old vineyards of, with Chardonnay in Argentina, but they were not planted with the best plant selections. You know, these were old plant selections. So we didn't have the great Chardonnay uh, as great as we had Malbec. So my father and I decided to bring in, you know, the best cuttings from France to Argentina in the early 90s. And that's what this Chardonnay is. It's, it's you know, really good plant selections, low yield, high quality selections. And, um, and why did we do it? Because we love Burgundy. Uh, so I, I, I am, you know, vain enough uh, that when you say, oh, you know, a, a French comparison, it, it's clearly a compliment. On the other hand, I am hoping that someday in the future, somebody will say to a Pouilly Fusé producer, <laughs> oh, this reminds me of Catena Chardonnay from the High Mountain Vine. <laughs> I hope so, so for your sake too. And we should mention we're not tasting tonight, um, but we do also offer the Catena Alta Chardonnay, which is another extremely lovely expression of the grape and um, coming in around $30 retail. Again, it competes with some of the best burgundies. It's so lovely. So that's worth checking out another time. In the interest of time, we just don't, uh, we can't feature all the beautiful ones yeah. of Catena today. Well, well the Catena Alta is, uh, comes from these historic roads. So it's a little richer, a little creamier. It's got a, it's got, a lot more, uh, you know, on the nose, on the palate. But I have people who prefer the Catena because they like a, you know, a slightly leaner, more mineral uh, Chardonnay. Uh, so it kind of depends on what you like. If you like the, the richer Chardonnay, I would go for the Catena Alta. Um, hey, Barb, just a, somebody was think was, I think it's Mindy from Weinbo who was going to show um, uh, maybe a presentation, but I don't know how she's going to do that because you and I are on the screen. So I think we're fine how we're doing, right? And maybe I show my screen with the website at some point, or what do you think? Um, if you want to show folks your website, or Mindy, if you want to ping me, I can make you a panelist. I just am not oh, finding you right now. Okay, and okay. In terms of a little bit of admin, um, clerical work here, folks, all of you joining us here live on Zoom, thank you so much. And we love the chats coming in. Comment on the wines. Hopefully you're all sharing at least one of these with us today. And also, if you have a question for Laura, please feel free to use the Q&A function. Uh, that's on the toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom window. That's how we're going to be able to help keep track of, I'm sure, burning questions you have. Um, looking here for Mindy then. Okay, so from Winebo. Oh, it says there's a... Uh, no, maybe not. But, but anyhow, in the meantime, I, if you want to share your screen um, and show yeah, the folks the map and the video them, you showed I want to show them the, the map that I showed you before. Let's see if... Uh, oh, wait. Uh, yes, here's the map. Okay. So uh, are we seeing the map? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. So first I wanna show you here, I'm gonna put my, my little pointer on Argentina, you know, this kind of big triangle. And then Mendoza is here what's marked uh, right by the Andes Mountains. Uh, and on the other side of the Andes Mountains is Chile. And then if you go all the way east to Buenos Aires, Buenos Aires is the capital of Argentina. People call it the Paris of South America because there's all these beautiful French style buildings. We have this very vibrant food scene. There's, you know, all kinds of steak. There's actually a lot of great vegetarian food in Argentina, believe it or not. There's, uh, you know, Asian fusion and, and everything imaginable. I mean, you can spend, I don't know, a year eating at a different restaurant in Buenos Aires and you'll never get tired. I mean, it's, there's 15 million people in, in Buenos Aires on its outskirts. So it is a metropolis and very diverse. There's people from all over the world. Uh, there's museums, there's theater. It's really a fantastic place. I actually know a lot of Americans who have taken a sabbatical year in Buenos Aires and really enjoyed it. Um, you can even send your kids to schools in Buenos Aires. It's an amazing place. Maybe not right now <laughs> because, because right now there's no flights. So because, you know, we were in summer and now we were going into the, you know, the fall and the winter um, in Argentina, uh, they, um, they have stopped all flights in or out of Argentina, which actually I think is a wise idea from the government because, you know, we have a very uh, low level of coronavirus cases, but as the winter comes, they might increase. And so I think the idea of not having people come in and get sick from our, our 
country or our people go out is, is wise. Uh, not, not that I want you to be scared of Argentina, uh, but, uh, but you know, they, when they open it, uh, in September, it'll be safer. But yeah, the, the flights to Argentina have been canceled, uh, which you know, was a real disappointment for me, but I think they're doing the right thing for, for the world and for our country, and it's the right thing to do. Uh, but when you're able to come to Argentina, <laughs> it's beautiful. Uh, and that's where Mendoza is. And you can either fly through Buenos Aires and then take a flight over to Mendoza, which is about an hour and a half, two hours. Or you can fly to Chile, and then you take just a half hour flight to Mendoza. Uh, so some people, what they'll do is they'll fly in through Chile, you know, stay a few days in Chile, go to Mendoza, then take a flight to Buenos Aires, and then fly out from Buenos Aires. Um, because if you come, you have to go to Buenos Aires, even for three days, just so that you eat a lot. <laughs> I can't imagine going all the way down to Argentina and not going to Buenos Aires. Although it's interesting to me you mentioned vegetarian dishes. I must admit, um, all I think of for food in Argentina is very salty meat. Yeah. So I'm glad that there's much more out there actually. Yeah, well the vegetables and fruits in Argentina are incredibly tasty and savory. And uh, I think it's because the poor soils, the same conditions that are good for uh, viticulture, um, you know, all along the, the Andes, we also have a lot of, um, you know, tomatoes and, and peaches and pears. And, and I think it just gives you really concentrated fruit and vegetables. And, you know, you know, those, those tomatoes that are all different colors, kind of like the heirloom tomatoes, but we have our own version that they're just so tasty. Um, those are the tomatoes we have, and they're just so juicy and slightly sweet. And um, yeah, the, the vegetables are really good too in Argentina for all the vegetarians out there. Um, and we also do this grilled cheese on the grill. It's called, pro, it's like a provolone and it's just like this circular thing like this, this big chunk of cheese. And then you put oregano on top and you, you eat that. No bread, just by itself. It's incredible, incredible. It's called provoleta. I already wanted to visit for the <laughs> meat and the culture and the yeah. wine. Now you're yeah. talking to me about grilled cheese. Yeah. You're not going to oh, be able to keep me off a plane. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, that grilled cheese goes really well with the Chardonnay. That's my choice. I imagine it does. Catana Chardonnay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, rumor okay. has it that you, uh, you're a big fan of French fries. Is that true? Because oh, I God. imagine those I'm go really fast. well with your Chardonnay, too. They do go really well. I... The first thing I do when I go to a new country is try their French fries <laughs> because French fries are different in every part of the world uh, and in different restaurants and um, Argentinian French fries are pretty good. Are those your but, favorite or would you give credit to another place for best French fries in the oh, world? Oh God, you know, there's this place in San Francisco called Nopa that has the most incredible and, and also Zuni Cafe. Um, but uh I don't know. Usually it's kind of wherever I'm eating them, I think those are the best ones. <laughs> Any French fry tastes good wherever you are, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I want okay. to um, move on maybe to the Cabernet yeah. next. Would you like yeah. to taste that? Oh, perfect. Yeah. yeah, let's taste that. And then I'll actually show you where the Cabernet comes from. So actually perfect. for the Chardonnay, you know, you see the vineyards by the mountains. Uh, so it's from a blend of three vineyards. And let's taste the Cabernet and we'll talk about um, where the Cabernet comes from. And um, you know, one thing that you should remember is that uh, the vineyards in Argentina are our own rooted. Uh, should we talk about that? Sure. So, you know, most vineyards in the world, um, so here's the Chardonnay in case people haven't seen it. It has the, the pyramid. Oh, I'll tell you guys a story about the pyramid. But most vineyards in the world are planted on American rootstocks because of phylloxera. So phylloxera is an aphid this little insect that um, grew up in America, in North America. And it basically adapted over, you know, thousands, millions of years to the American vine. And so the phylloxera and the American vine can live together and the phylloxera doesn't eat the American vine or maybe it nibbles, but it doesn't destroy it. Now, when some French people decided, oh, let's take some of these beautiful American vines over to France, they're pretty, uh, you know, for decoration, they brought them over and they didn't realize that they had this phylloxera insect in the roots. And then some of them said, oh, they're so beautiful, let's plant them in our vineyard. And then all of a sudden their vineyards were dying because their vines, the Vitis vinifera, had not co-evolved 
with the phylloxera. So they started dying. And um, if it wasn't for uh, actually an entomologist from Missouri who came up with grafting, an American rootstock bottom with a vitis vinifera like the Cabernet, Chardonnay, Malbec on top, and then planting this together so the roots would be American vine and they would be resistant to phylloxera and the grapes would be from the vitis vinifera, we wouldn't have wine today as we know it because the American vines make a, a wine that's, you know, it, I've had some, it's not bad, but it's not, you know, th this kind of age worthy, really special wine that comes from the, the European varieties, but actually they're Middle Eastern varieties because the vitis vinifera came from the Middle East in, in the first place. So anyhow, so most vineyards in the world are planted on these rootstocks, but in Argentina, phylloxera, this, this aphid, does not really um, survive. We have some of it, but it, the flying phylloxera doesn't survive. It's not humid. And so we don't have a big problem. So most of the vineyards are planted on their uh, vitis vinifera, on the European rootstock. And uh, I mean, most of Europe's and the US vineyards, Australian vineyards are planted on rootstocks, but in Argentina, most vineyards are planted, 90% are planted on their own roots. Um, which, you know, that would be like a five hour conversation if we were here <laughs> with, with viticulturalists, because some people say it makes a difference, some people say it doesn't. I mean, the American rootstocks are a little hardier. They're, they're better with water, with drought. Uh, so actually, we are, we are in some areas, we plant with rootstocks, really stony soils, um, because, you know, the vines do better. So this uh, Cabernet, um, do you smell the, the little spiciness, the pepperiness on the nose? Yeah, yeah. So There's yeah. a lot of really pretty um, berry fruit in this, too. Um, like blackberry and maybe yeah. pink currants. Uh, definitely oh, yeah. a, little, Currant. a little bang of spice that I um, yeah. don't, don't always associate with Cabernet, but it's really showing well. Yeah, so our Cabernet has a nice amount of what we call pyrazines, which are what, what give that, that spiciness, but we don't ever get green flavors. And we've actually done some research on that. And it seems like we have so much sun because of the high altitude that, that it, it makes those green flavors go away. So we have the spiciness and the, the black fruit, some, some of the currants, like you said, um, but we don't ever get that sort of bell pepper. That it's, it's almost impossible to get it uh, in Argentine wine. And then the one thing that's different about Argentine Cabernet is that although it's, it's really rich, you'll notice that it's very smooth. You know how like usually, Cabernet for most places will have that really tannic grip. Um, Argentine Cabernet is, is pretty solid in terms of structure, but it's very smooth. I wonder if you have any thoughts on sort of recent trend over the last few years, this um, more lush kind of luxurious style Cabernet. A lot of people refer to them as maybe fruit bombs, um, mm -hmm. kind of higher ABV and a lot of people suspect residual sugar. What do you think yeah. about that in Cabernet yeah. and how have you yeah. managed to sort of buck that trend? Yeah, so, you know, for me, the style of the wine should be shaped by the place it comes from. You know, the wine should taste like it comes from that particular place. Uh, some places, um, let's say you're, you're farming Cabernet in a very warm place. Well, that wine is gonna have a lot of sugar, which is going to turn into alcohol and then is not going to, you know, it's going to ripen fully at a very high alcohol, uh, you know, at a better, very high sugar, because if you were to harvest it earlier when the sugar is, you know, for an alcohol level of 13, it wouldn't be fully ripe. So that wine from that place is going to have, you know, a very alcoholic, you know, kind of uh, maybe going on the, some very ripe flavors. And that's going to be the taste of that place. Um, in Argentina, the mountain climate and this uh, wine here, the Cabernet, um, oh, I'm going to do the little arrow. So it comes from a blend of this vineyard, which is around 3,000 feet elevation, um, a little bit from this vineyard, which is around you know, 4,000 feet elevation, a little less. And then actually further south, the, the next vineyard is not here, but it's, it's right down here where I'm circling. So these are all pretty cool climate areas, very stony soil. So in these places, we have a very long season, like three months. And the bricks, which is what the sugar measurement, 
might go up by just one. So they'll go from you know, 22.5 to 23.5. In most places, that happens in one week. But it's so cold at night. And, it's, and, and it's, it's really just overall cool and very sunny towards the end of the season that we're able to ripen really slowly. So we have moderate alcohol. So the alcohols for these wines are around 13, 13.5. So that's not super high. Uh, but they're fully ripe, you know, so you do have the the lushness and the spiciness, but you don't have uh, in this wine a lot of overripe flavors. Uh, and some people actually really like that those real, what you were saying, you know, those really big wines that often you'll put a lot of oak into. We, th that's not the style that we make because first of all, it, we could probably make it in our place if we were to leave the grapes on the vine longer, if we were to add sugar, which is actually illegal in Argentina, so we couldn't even do that. Um, but the style from Argentina is more classic, but it's maybe a little riper than let's say from places like Bordeaux. It, the general style would be like a relatively warm year in Bordeaux would be our style, but, but not with very high alcohol. And also we have really nice natural acidity from the altitude. So I, I consider the wine style of my family and our vineyards as being fairly classic. And we don't look for that, um, that big style. Um, and we couldn't really produce, there would be a few places in Argentina where you might be able to, to get to it, but, but it's not the right place for it. Um, and we also don't use excessive oak. We actually don't have an oak regimen that is static. Uh, so for example, uh, one year we might use, uh, on a particular wine, we might use 20% New York. Another year we'll use 10% New York. Another year we'll use 30% New York. It'll depend on the grapes, on the flavor, how much New York we will use. Because what we don't want is one of those wines where, you know, you put your, your, you know, the wine to your nose and the first thing you smell is oak. Um, and we never want that to happen with our wines. And I'd say, and hopefully some folks are tasting the cab with us too, but I'd say, it's definitely true of this. Uh, this one is the 2016 Cabernet Sauvignon, of course. Um, and I, I would also use the word classic. There's something vaguely reminiscent of Bordeaux, um, but it has some really lovely fruit. Like I said, those berry notes are coming out. And yeah. certainly there's some oak, but I find it really nicely integrated. Um, well, I forgot that we're drinking 2016 because I, I hadn't uh, looked uh, when I poured my bottle, but 16 is the coldest vintage that anybody remembers. So this particular cab is, is even more classic than, than, than in most years. So it's, it's even more mineral and more Bordelais style. Uh, I think if you have some other vintages like the 18, like the 2012, um, even the 19, it'll be a little riper. Uh, I think these 16s are going to age really well. I would be willing to bet with anybody, you know, put this wine in the cellar for 20 years and open it and you will be blown away. I have some Catena cabs and Malbecs uh, from the 90s and they're just incredible right now. So if you can resist the temptation. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing, especially for a bottle at, you know, such a modest, really value driven yeah. price point. The cab is $17.99 and I agree. It's going to hang in there a couple more years at least. Um, we had a question come in. I think it's from Facebook, uh, if you don't mind answering. Yeah, um, absolutely. With, I'm going to do the stop share. Yeah. With Malbec uh, being Mendoza's flagship variety and what the export market knows best, can you share your thoughts on the future of Cabernet? Uh, have plannings been increasing or gaining in popularity, or are you pretty much staying static? Well, so uh, there's Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc, uh, both planted in Argentina. And uh, Cabernet Franc is actually very fashionable right now in Argentina, just like Pinot Noir. You know, things are always fashionable when, when there's not a lot of them. <laughs> People like scarcity. So, uh, you know, there's maybe a thousand hectares of Cab Franc, uh, you know, about the same of Pinot Noir planted in Argentina. And there's, you know, 50,000 hectares of Malbec. Uh, but to answer the question, we at Catena, we think that Cabernet and Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon and Franc have great potential in Argentina, especially in some of these areas with clay soils, with cool climate areas. And uh, we, uh, we make a wine called Nicolas Catena Zapata that I know you, you, you carry, uh, which is a blend of Cabernet and Malbec that is, I think, one of our best aging wines for aging. 
Um, and I think the Catena Cabernet, you know, at, at this really reasonable price is another like, really good Cabernet. It comes from all our own vineyards. Our vineyards are planted at different altitudes, but we always select the soil and the place that we think will do best uh, for Cabernet Sauvignon. And all the plant selections we have, we have two selections. One are pre phylloxeric selections that have been in Argentina for, you know, over 100 years. And then some are, uh, you know, newer selections, but they're actually really old. Like one of them is the supposed Margot clone, which is, you know, probably hundreds of years old from France, but we plant it for quality. So uh, we are planting more Cabernet every year. Uh, if we plant Malbec, we usually plant Cabernet as well. We usually plant more Malbec because we have more demand for it. But my father is, is, is a Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc fanatic. And our winemaker, Alejandro Gil, you know, my father's more Cabernet Sauvignon, our winemaker is more Cab Franc. They both love Malbec, but their, their little side variety <laughs> love affairs are with Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc. So we always plant uh, those two varieties. And um, they uh, can be blended sometimes with Malbec for, to add structure because Malbec you know, sometimes uh, needs a little structure. It depends. From some areas, Malbec has plenty of structure, but from other areas, it needs Cabernet. So sorry for the very long answer, but I do think that Cabernet Sauvignon has great potential in Argentina, and um, we are planting more of it every year. Yeah. Yeah, this bottling is any indication, and the times I've been able to taste uh, the Alta Cabernet as well, um, also the Nicolas Catena, um, Michael, who's watching now, was kind enough to share with me at a dinner once. Uh, the age, the aging capacity on these wines is really something special, so yeah. thanks for sharing that about the Cabernet. It's, it's so funny because I, I think you found a perfect niche for yourself where your passion for wine and your passion for science really come together. Um, it's so interesting to listen to you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and somebody was asking about the 2016 vintage. Yes, that's, I think the 16 will, vin will age for 20 years easily. I think many of the other vintages will too, but for the 16, I'm very sure. I mean, I would bet on 50 years and, and I, I am unlikely to be alive in 50 years. So I'm not worried about making promises. <laughs> Still with one glass of wine a day, you may just end up there. <laughs> uh, yeah, you never know, you never know. Um, I think okay. we want to move on to the Melbuck, of course. Okay, um, very good. If yeah. you're okay, if we're finished with yeah. Cabernet, is that okay? Uh, yeah. I'm sure this is the one most people recognize, I would consider, yeah. and imagine you do as well, This the workhorse for Catena and most oh, yeah. bodegas in Argentina. This is the 2017 Malbec. So, um, you know what I call this wine? I call it uh, the winery's Chanel number no. five. <laughs> because, uh, you know, uh, I remember, you know, when I, when I was in my early 20s, uh, I think my dad came back from a trip and uh, he, you know, of course, you go to the duty free and, and he said this Chanel number no. five, you know, this is like the epitome of, uh, you know, French uh, classic um, perfume. And uh, then I, I've read a lot about it and, and how they, they try to keep the, 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 the style consistent and how important it is for all the Chanel products that the Chanel number no. five be just an extraordinary perfume. And I think of Catena Malbec as, as you know, sort of our, our, our presentation card. You know, many people uh, drink Malbec for the first time they drink Catena Malbec. Uh, it's presented at Master of Wine, Master of Somedi exams. This is their blind Malbec. Uh, and so, you know, this wine is very important to us. We can't ever mess it up. And it comes from a blend of actually four different sites at different altitudes. Remember the map I showed you before, different soils, different altitudes. Um, and every year we might use more or less from one region depending on the vintage. Um, and the idea is that it will reflect the vintage, but it'll also have, um, you know, a consistent style. And what is that consistent style? A little bit of the floral aromatics from the south of the Uco Valley, the texture that comes from the clay soils um, of the La Piramide area. Um, La Piramide is the pyramid where the winery is. And then we have these old vines where our Malbec selection comes from. And um, the, that uh, area is called Lulunda, and those old vines 
just have this, this kind of overall balance. And when you put all these together, this is um, Catena Malbec. And, and it really should be a wine that if you've tasted it uh, many times, you should be, you know, you should be recognizing it blind. And, and it's very malbec -y. You know, it's, it, really, it really smells and tastes uh, like Malbec. And, um, and, and actually, I would like to take this uh, opportunity to tell you a little bit about the story of Malbec, which is very dear to my heart, uh, because there were a couple of years where I used to get asked all the time, you know, what comes after Malbec in Argentina? And, you know, I, I, it kind of bothered me, but, you know, you get asked the question by a journalist, you answer it. And, um, and uh, you know, I started doing a lot of research on Malbec and I found out that it was this really ancient grape. It dates back to Roman times, 2000 years old. It was famous at the court of love of Eleanor of Aquitaine in the 12th century. You know, she brought Malbec to, to England and made it famous all over Europe. Then it was actually more widely planted than Cabernet Sauvignon in the Medoc in the middle of the 19th century, you know, where all the, the famous um, first growth come from. Cab Malbec was more widely planted than Malbec. But what happened with Phylloxera is that Malbec is very delicate. So they have a lot colder weather, they have more rain. And in really cold years, and this happens in Argentina also, the yields go down. Actually, that happened in this year. This is the 17. In 17, we had a like, yield down about 50% because we had a frost. And, you know, the French did not like this. Cabernet is actually a tougher grape. And so when Malbec came to Argentina, it was when it was the heydays of Malbec in Bordeaux. Then, this is 1850, then the 1870s uh, and uh, you know, the, the late 1800s, the Loxra hits. And when they replant, they say, we don't want this delicate grape. And they replant with Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon. Merlot providing that sort of smoothness and velvetiness that was the Malbec's job before. And so basically Malbec practically disappears and it would have disappeared from the world if it weren't for the fact that it came to Argentina, it adapted so well to Argentina, to the mountain climate. And, and to me, it's the story of a successful immigrant, you know? Malbec was a successful immigrant to Argentina. And, you know, then over generations and generations, it's, it's gotten better and better. And uh, I think it's a really beautiful story. And, and the future of Malbec, when people ask me, is, more regional Malbec, more Malbec from a specific location, you know, just more Malbec made in different ways uh, from different producers. Uh, you know, the way, you know, you wouldn't ask somebody in Burgundy, what comes after Pinot Noir, right? Mm -hmm. No, because, you know, there's so much Pinot Noir to explore from all the different appellations. And I think that is something you're, you're probably already seeing it more, uh, you know, single appellation Malbec, more more different Malbecs from different regions. And that's something that I think we're gonna start seeing more outside of Argentina. But uh, that's an important message that there just, there's not, nothing after Malbec, there's more Malbec. <laughs> I like the notion of studying it from different regions and a tasting we did just a few weeks ago for uh, Malbec World Day, one of our selections was from Patagonia and it did show oh, very differently than something from different. Mendoza. So yeah, I look forward to the continued evolution of this break, but the, the 17 uh, Mendoza, I like the way you describe it, it's almost uh, as if it's a, a house style as champagne yeah. would be described yeah. that yeah. Uh, of course every year is a little different, but um, it's so notably, yeah, Malbec. I like the floral notes, the dark fruit. It's, it's really nice. Anyone else uh, out there enjoying Malbec? You can let us know in the chat. Somebody's including their, uh, our Catena Malbec in their quarantine wine basket. I definitely approve. <laughs> oh, and, and, and um, Veronica is going to tell her mom that, that she's having Chanel number five. <laughs> Chanel number five. I'll never see the bottle again and not think of that. Yeah. So again, that was the 17 um, Mendoza Malbec. And the last wine we want to taste today, uh, the main event for me anyway, um, is the Catena Alta Malbec. Yeah, yeah you got go. it. I have it too. Yeah. And it's, oh, another, and then this is 16. Again, we're going for this cool vintage, age worthy. Uh, so the Catena Alta Malbec, Alta means high. And it refers to uh, the fact that there's high altitude vineyards, but also to the high quality. And also another thing you're going to see on the label is it says historic rose. So, you know, if you talk to any farmer that owns a vineyard, they'll tell you 
okay, so that little part over there, you know, under that little tree, that's where my best wine comes from. In every vineyard, there's a few parcels that historically give, you know, the, the most concentrated, the most aromatic, you know, the, the best grapes. Even if you have a beautiful vineyard all around, there'll be one spot that's particularly special. And that's why th this wine comes from these historic rows, uh, because it takes time to figure out, you know, which is that little parcel. So this wine comes from uh, five different locations. You know, remember the map, they start, you know, from near the winery and they go down south. And um, again, the texture that comes from all the different uh, microclimates at high altitude, but the plant selection is a selection that we made and it's pre phylloxeric So it's a selection that came to Argentina, uh, you know, at some point in the middle of the 19th century. And these um, uh, vines have small berries, small bunches and very low yields. What is left today in Europe, what was kept in Europe, is much more productive, up to five or six times more productive. And it has bigger berries and bigger bunches. And that's not to say that the Malbec that's made today in other parts of the world is not good because I've had some really beautiful Malbec from California, from France, but it's a different population of vines because the vines that were brought to Argentina were lost afterwards because they tried to keep the higher yielding vines because they had this problem with frost and with yields. Uh, so it's, it's a very special selection. It comes from an old vineyard that was planted in the 1930s and it's our own plant selection of 135 different cuttings that we plant in all the different vineyards that belong to our family. So this wine, the Catenata Malbec, is made from vineyards planted with this original plant selection, which we call the Catena cuttings. Yeah. That's really beautiful. Even the side-by-side -side comparison is really something, you know, same grape, same general part of the world made by the same people. Um, but just even in the aromatics, it's so much more pronounced. And that yeah. fruit, it all just smells a little more luxurious, um, but really yeah. well balanced. I'm actually indulging in the 2015. So we have two okay. different vintages today. Yeah, well, the 15 is also a pretty cool vintage. Not as cool as 16, but, but a pretty cool vintage. Um, and, uh, you know, the Catina Alta Malbec has a little more concentration. It actually allows us to put a little more new oak in it because the fruit is so powerful that, you know, the oak, you don't even smell it or, you know, it's really well integrated. Actually, one thing about Malbec is that it has natural vanillin. So you might be poured a Malbec that they tell you has no oak and you're going to say, hey, you're lying to me. This wine has oak. But it, I'm, they're probably telling you the truth because uh, Malbec naturally has a little bit of vanilla on, on the nose. Yeah, and a little chocolate as well, but it's it's not from the oak. It's actually from from the variety itself. Yeah, it's definitely a little of that like cocoa on this for sure. But I never knew that about the melon. Yeah, well, we didn't know it either until the director of the Catena Institute, uh, actually Fernando Usema, studied at UC Davis, and he did a research project on Malbec uh, in California and Argentina, comparing different areas, and they discovered this because they were tasting wines without oak, and everybody was picking up vanilla. Interesting. Yeah. Do you ever consider, this is going back a little ways, I know your family came from central Italy, right? Do you ever uh, consider going back to yeah, Marque? Yeah. 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 Uh, have you or your father or anybody considered going back there and making wine, uh, kind of going back to your roots? Or is there anywhere well, else in the world you've ever thought about setting up wine operations well you know my brother actually um he has his own wine brands at meso catena vineyards uh that you might have tasted and he actually has a little vineyard in italy that he's making some oh. wine there right now but i personally uh you know despite the fact that um i live between the u.s and argentina and i have a, a american husband who is you might not know this from quad cities no, Did I you know, know that my my other family lives near chicago so um, I, I always say, if you're in doubt, marry a Midwestern man, <laughs> because they're, they're, he's such a good father. You know, he, I am a terrible parent in that I let my kids do anything. You know, I'm, I'm strict about school, but I'm not strict about other things. But my, my husband teaches them manners. And I am so grateful for that, because I'm, I'm not very good at teaching that. So 
Um, so I have a connection to, to the Midwest. Uh, but going back to, um, to wine, you know, my heart is a Mendoza. And I've lived in Italy, actually. I, I've lived there with my family. You know, my kids have gone to school there. My kids speak Italian. Um, and, you know, I live in Argentina part of the year. Um, and I've lived in the U.S. But, you know, I make wine in Argentina. And honestly, I am not tempted. There are many Argentines. There's Chileans. There's, there's many wineries that have wineries all over the world, like the Torres family. You know, but I am not tempted to do that. I really believe that my wine heart is in Argentina. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy, you know, traveling the world, selling Argentine wine, making wine in Argentina. But uh, I also feel that to do something really well, you have to be 100% dedicated. And I don't have one minute to spare because every minute I have, I need to be studying more about the microbes in the soil. The, the, the differences between, you know, this vineyard right here and this other little area right there. And I don't even have enough time to do that. Like making wines, you know, like my, my dad's challenge is that we need to make wines that are up there with the best of the world. That is a high challenge. <laughs> and, uh, you know, well, we were talking when we started, uh, Barb, about this award of Catena Most Admired Wine Brand in the World. We just received this award, our winery which was a complete surprise from Drinks International, a very prestigious British magazine, that we were voted by experts uh, in 48 countries from around the world, number one most admired wine, wine brand in the world. And we are above all these really famous names. And they first told us, oh, you're among the top. And then they told us we were number one. And we said, what? Like mm -hmm. our little winery in Argentina? And, and somebody was asking me the other day, well, you know, after hearing this news, do you just like, go have a party and relax. And I'm like, no, it's, it's the worst. Like now I'm even more stressed out because you know, how do you stay up there? You know, how do we keep on making great wines and, and doing that? So part of why I'm not tempted, you know, of course, when I go to Italy, I think like, oh, wouldn't it be nice to live in this little house here in the vineyards? I mean, we all have that fantasy, <laughs> but I know that I cannot stop working hard in Argentina to, 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 you know, we're finding new regions to make wines. We're, we're doing this whole sustainability organic farming project. I have to, you know, teach sustainability to all the producers in Argentina, you know, because, you know, we work a lot with growers, with other producers. And honestly, I can't imagine how I could do that and make wine anywhere else. So that's my long answer. That's a fantastic answer. I think accolades for people like us, it just helps challenge you to work harder. It sounds like that's exactly what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, speaking of your, your parenting skills, uh, are the kids working at all in winery operations or in the vineyard at all? Kind of what do you see for the future, fifth generation maybe, of Catenas? Yeah, well, you know, I have my kids and I have nieces and nephews. Some are very little, so we don't know yet. And my children I have from 14 to 21. My oldest son uh, is finishing college in the U.S. right now, and he's going to do a Ph.D. in organic chemistry at UCLA. And he says he has no interest in wine, but I'm like, hey, organic Neither chemistry. Neither did you. <laughs> yeah, but organic chemistry, like wine is organic chemistry, basically, right? But uh, so he, he's doing his own thing. And I didn't either. When I went to medicine, I thought I was going to spend my life drinking the family's wines, not making them. But then my middle son, Dante, actually, he really likes working at the winery. And I, I you know, he twice a year during his vacation, he works at the winery for several weeks or months. And he knows everybody, you know, he likes working with the barrels and, you know, doing the punch downs. He likes doing the manual labor. That's what he enjoys the most and tasting. But, you know, he, I didn't allow him to taste before he was 18. I, somebody might have let him, but I, when I was there, I said no. And then in Argentina, you're allowed to drink at 18, but I still make him spit because, you know, I, I do believe that people shouldn't drink uh, until they're in their, their 20s because their brains are still forming. But uh, he loves working at the winery. And my daughter, um, you know, she's 14. So at the, at the winemaking facility, you really can't have young people because it's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, machines and, and uh, you know, it, it, it will be illegal. I can't, you know, do anything that wouldn't be allowed. Although actually family members, there, there is a law in Argentina, as I think there is in the U.S., that family members can work in family businesses. But she, so I told her she couldn't be yet at the production uh, 
site because, you know, I didn't know if it would be safe. But uh, she first uh, tried social media and she thought, she said we were terrible at social media. <laughs> because, you know, she's used to the really quick Snapchat, all these things and TikTok. And she said our stuff was really boring. Uh, but then, uh, then, then she moved on to hospitality and she loved that. That she was in her in her territory, you know, uh, greeting. She she liked the cash register when people were, you know, uh, checking people out and people were buying wine. That was her favorite position, uh, bringing the cash in. <laughs> if she ever spends any time in Chicago, you can let her know. <laughs> Benny's is always hiring. <laughs> okay, good. Maybe that would be a good place to start. You know, where I had my start, uh, you know, I did all these trips to France with my father. And I got to know all these producers. But where I really learned about wine was there was a restaurant near where I was living in San Francisco where the wine buyer invited me to sit with him when he was uh, being presented wine. You know, what you do for many hours a day. And uh, I sat next to him watching, uh, you know, the salespeople come by and present the wines. And that, that's the, the, that was the best learning experience I ever had, uh, you know, sitting next to a wine buyer. It, it was really extraordinary, you know, such diversity, uh, hear, hearing all the different stories from all the different wineries. Uh, I did that for, for a year. It, it was like going to school. Amazing. It is a very hands-on job, for sure. Yeah. I, uh, I know you're a busy lady, and I don't want to take up too much more of your time. And we shot for 30 to 40 minutes, and here we are almost oh an God. hour in. So uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Dr. Laura Catena, I want to thank you for your time. Um, you. There's a couple other questions floating around out there if you just have like a minute. Uh, from John on Facebook, you mentioned Catena Zapata. How long is the hold time for that wine? He has 2010 and he says it's wonderful oh, now, but he's just wondering on time frames. Well, 2010, uh, the Nicolas Catena Zapata right now is fantastic. I, I literally had it maybe a week ago. It was so good. Uh, easily 10 more years, 20 more years. But I am not worried about that wine. Yeah. Easily, you say. <laughs> I, think, um, I think that probably wraps us up. This has been such an enormous pleasure. Once again, this has been a big honor for me to get to oh, speak with you, you, learn about your hats. And uh, yeah. for all you folks out there, please stay tuned. Our Facebook page on Instagram and on the events page on our website. We've got all kinds of fun stuff like this coming up with other winemakers, although probably none as wonderful as you. <laughs> no. Thanks again for sharing the Melbach, especially. on them is the hat. <laughs> That's probably true, and the scarves. And the scarves, exactly. <laughs> well, folks, thanks yeah. again so much. And okay. thank you, Bob. Thank you, Laura. It was nice to meet okay. you. Take care. Thanks, Cheers, everybody. Folks. Enjoy your, your time with your family and stay safe. I love you guys. Bye. Thank, thank you. you.